A year ago, the exhibition New Type, Three Pioneers of Hebrew Graphic Design, opened in the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem. The exhibition displayed design and topography works of Moshe Spitzer, Francisca Baruch, and Henry Friedlander, who laid the foundation of modern Hebrew bookmaking, graphic design, and typography. The research that led me to curate the exhibition started from this portrait of Moshe Spitzer, which appeared in a daily newspaper, Haaret, seven years ago. It was part of an article about the painter, Avigdor Aricha, who painted his good friend and mentor Spitzer on a very hot day. The article mentioned briefly Spitzer's typographical work, the books of rare beauty which he designed and edited in Germany and in Jerusalem. I remembered Spitzer from my childhood when he used to visit my father, Ariel Vardi. Spitzer was my father's mentor in his first steps as book designer and close friend. I became also a graphic designer, and at that time, I began to teach in Vizzo Academic Center a course about book designing, and realized, again, that there was a lake of information, documentation, and research regarding Hebrew typography and the de designers who worked here before us. So I asked my father to tell me more about Spitzer, which he did, and took down some books from the shelf. The books were perfect, meticulous. Each book had its own concept and format, all done in high standard and no uncomparison quality. The typography in each one of them accurate and free at the same time. All the books were edited, designed, and published by Spitzer in his Tarshish publication in Jerusalem. Together with my father and Meron Ehren, the owner of Kedem Auction House, who was also fascinated by the book Spitzer published, and together with Professor Adi Stern, typographer and president of Bezalel Academy in Jerusalem, we started to look for more information about him, but we found very little data. So Meron, Meron my father and I, decided to aim at a book which will document and present the work of Moshe Spitzer. In one of the many interviews with Spitzer children, they told us about a basement where all Spitzer documents and library are kept. A whole year went by until we got permission to go into the dark, dusty basement. This was a turning point in our project for two reasons. In terms of data, this was a real treasure. We found files and files of correspondence, rare typography book, sketches for new types, all this in piles up to the ceiling of the neglected basement. But along with the joy of finding the treasure, it became clear to me that data on Spitzer was not lacking. It was simply in the wrong place, scattered, mixed, unsorted, and disorganized. Until we find a solution, I brought to my studio a few boxes we considered most important. Only then did I realize that these cases contains the basis of Spitzer Archive and for the beginning of our research. Among the material which I brought to my studio, studio there were sketches of types correspondence with Max Brod, the philosopher Martin Buber, and also books designed and edited by Spitzer during the 30s in Germany. These books, typical Bauhaus design and inspired by Insel publications, comprised the best of Hebrew books through the ages. In the boxes, I found also correspondences and consolation with other typographers, among them Francisca Baruch and Henry Friedlander. Their names were familiar to me, as were the types they designed, but again, I found very little information about them. By that time, I learned from Spitzer that materials do not vanish, you have to search better. And so I decided to look for the archives while working at the same time on Spitzer book. One search on Google led me to the Israeli Museum. The archives were there, but closed, not classified, and not available for study. Spitzer's story repeated. 
I requested to see them, and from the little I was allowed to see, I found much similarities between the three archives. The three designers studied and worked in Germany during the 20s and were influenced by German culture and integrated into their, into their work later in Israel. Thus, for example, among the virtuous and surprising materials in Baruch archive, I found sketches for the city of Jerusalem emblem side by side with sketches of the Weimar Republic emblem, both of them designed by Baruch. Friedlander archive was loaded with Latin calligraphy exercise and detailed documentation of his work process on Hebrew types. Later, we found the parts of Friedlander's whole archive, which he divided according to the various stages of his life, Germany, Holland, and Israel. Among them, this calligraphic work on the left, which he drew in the early 40s when he was hiding during the war in his home in Holland. Looking at the three archives, I realized that they make, in fact, a complete documented chapter of the history of Hebrew typography, which was never really researched, but that these materials tell even a more comprehensive story than design. They present a visual story of historical events, technological innovation, and cultural development, something like cultural DNA. A romantic vision of bringing the three together again turned into the idea of trio exhibition, and I sat down to write a proposal to the Israeli Museum. Due to the German roots of the three and the interest drawn by their work in the two cultures, I approached Caroline Yassen, representative of Marbach, the German Literature Archive. With her assistant, Marbach joined the project of classifying and cataloging the archive and later, with, together with Getty Institute, support the whole project. The support of Marbach and Getty enabled me to recruit Liron Lavi, who is sitting here with us, researcher, typographer from Israel, and Philip Messner, archivist and researcher of modern Hebrew type design from Switzerland. Liron Lavi and Philip joined me and Caroline and researched the Monotype Archive, the Archive of Amsterdam Un University, Klingsfond Museum in Offenbach, and more. Their enlightening article, together with those of Adi Stern and other literature and cultural scholars, appears in the exhibition catalog, which hold more than 20 articles. So one of the main topics of the research was the quest after a new Hebrew type. In the beginning of the 20th century, as a result of, of secular process and integration with the surrounding environment, the Hebrew language, which was, still, which was until then sacred and used for religious purposes, became slowly an everyday language. Its visual representation, Hebrew script, had remained almost unchanged. Most of the types tried to imitate the calligraphic handwritten script closely as possible and were based on these two styles found in medieval European manuscript. An urgent need occurred for a new Hebrew type, which will suit and represent the new developing culture and also fit new printing techniques. Baruch, Spitzer, and Friedlander each had its own idea and proposal of a new Hebrew type derived from completely different approaches. A large part of Baruch's work was based on lettering. The seeds of her work were planted in 1920 when as a young student in Kunstmuseum in Berlin. Her sketchbook from these years contains a large variety of type copy, mostly from medieval manuscript she found in a museum library directed by Peter Yassin. During the 40s, when she was already in Jerusalem, Zalman Shoken, a wealthy publisher and bibliophile, asked her to design for him a new Hebrew type. Shoken's attitude was to combine tradition and modernity. He identified the Hebrew type from the early 16th century, a worthy basis of this work. 
Baruch poured over the Bloomberg Bible and books printing by the famous Italian Shunzino family of printing. Her work actually was a fascinating revival process. She used enlarged photographs of the printed types and arranged their different instants next to each other, extracting this way the genome of the letter form. She then began to draw the letters in comparating styles of sources she had studied. Here on the left. In the late 43, Stanley Morrison, typographic advisor to Monotype, company suggested to develop the font to five sizes and add the critical signs. The proof prints that reach Jerusalem, down here to the right, were far beneath her expectation due to the transition from drawing the letters by hand to tracing them with curved rulers, period to casting, the shape of the letter form changed. Baruch and Shoken made many comments as can be seen here. Special effort was focused on the doting problem, which was alien to monotype, but critical to Shoken and Baruch. The whole work lasted more than 10 years, and due to the war in Europe, communication was difficult and slow. The Shoken font came out in 1955 in five measures, an unprecedented event in the country. However, it was not well received as was accepted and used only in few books. Maybe the calligraphic look which held traditional elements placed the type in the old world rather in the new one. During the 50s, when Shoken type arrived for monotype, Jerusalem type foundry was already operating in Jerusalem. It was built by Spitzer, who wanted to enrich and enlarge the sparse collection of types available in the country at that time. He was encouraged to do so by Harry Carter, the typographer and historian of type, who was serving in Palestine during the 40s. Carter tried also to cut a new set of Hebrew types, and as there were no educated equipment, did it by hand. He called the type Bezalel and documented the whole procedure in an article which was published in a local Jerusalem Post daily. Spitzer Foundry was active almost 10 years, thus enriching and enlarging the inventory of Hebrew type in the country. Sp Spitzer knowledge about typography was enormous and comprehensive. It serves a basis of a founding essay he wrote on the development of the Hebrew letter. His expert's knowledge and keen eye enabled him to take part in the in design process of new types. Among them, here on the left, one of the weights he completed to the type Patsvi and also developed the cursive type Rahat. An experimental new type that Spitzer produced in his foundry is Gil, designed by Eri Gil, who visited Palestine in 1934. The typeface is based on character size of Latin letters curved in stone. The design is contrary to the essence and tradition of Hebrew script, and maybe Spitzer's great appreciation of the British typeface designer Eri Gil was the reason to produce this type. And Henry Friedlander, typographer, printer, calligrapher, and a mentor who studied with the best professionals in Germany at that time, like Hermann Delitzsch, Jakob Hegner, and Rudolf Koch, accepted also the challenge to design a new Hebrew type. He too relayed on origins of writing, but unlike Baruch, who tried to revive the letters, Friedlander used these origins as starting point and went on an independent path-breaking road. He began already in 1931 when he was working at Officina Hag Drogolin Printing Press. He recognized the Hebrew typeface are still based on copies of handwritten script using a board nib pen, a quill, or a brush. So his first stage were therefore to free the letter from the serif, which characterized calligraphic writing. He sent the first samples 
to Stanley Morrison, who criticized the samples, and urged Friedlander to distance more from calligraphic look. Friedlander agrees and writes, my Hebrew, will, my Hebrew writing will strive to look as it was cut, not drawn. This was one of the guiding lines in Friedlander's work on Hadassah typeface. Following his correspondence with Morrison, Friedlander also realized that in order to develop a typeface which, which is adapted to modern printing method, he has to work on various weights, regular, italic, and heavy. It took almost 30 years for the final version to come out when Friedlander is already living in Jerusalem. The typeface was immediately and successfully accepted as can be seen here, and it has no association with calligraphic writing and resembles more a curved letter. In his article for the catalog, Adi Stern draws attention to Friedlander's attempts in his work on Hadassah to recreate and return elements of Koch approach. Koch typefaced Neuland, on the left here, released in 1923, is completely different from Hadassah, yet the cut of the two typefaces outline is similar in character, an attempt to characterize the type by the material of which it is made. The change of the material and its influence on the form of the type has been with Hadassah all along. Liron Lavie describes in her article these sketches which document the transition Friedlander made from typesetting letters to IBM types. The sketches illustrate well the softening of the type, the change of the crookness, and decrease of tension between heavy and thin line. And between 1973 and 1979, Friedlander was given a completely different commission from IBM to design Hebrew types which will suit Latin types used by the company. The work was done with Frutiger, who was the company's advisor at that time. This request to unify Latin and Hebrew was totally different from the starting basis of Hadassah nor from Baruch's work on Shoken both of which began from historical origin, looking at the form of the type mainly as a particular cultural identity. This work, process, and stages were part of the materials presented in the exhibition. The display tables were planned according to the various kinds of materials to be shown. As background to the structure of the tables, there were reference The exhibition was planned as joint working space for the three designers. Each designer was allotted a, a defined space suitable to his person. Spitzer in the middle, center, and, and total. Friedlander to the right, deductive and in a strict grid. And Baruch, virtuous and eclectic. Looked at form above the exhibition scheme, resemble a typographic base by itself. In order to present the time and the place where the material for the exhibition was curated, we chose to use the new Hebrew version of the type Akurat, designed by Yana Kiontev, who is also here with us, following, following the Latin type designed by Lawrence Brunner. This was the font debate. For the title of the exhibition, we choose the type Friedlander Hadassah, designed by Jan also by Yannick, according to original sketches from found in Friedlander archive. The, the exhibition attracted a large public and stayed open for almost nine months. And two last point for closure. The catalog part, parts of which were translated into English and with a chronic Chroni chronological document tablet prepared by Philip of Hebrew typeface design in the area of late type setting. 
Along these types, Philip prepared examples of Latin types which were designed parallel to Hebrew ones. This tablet illustrates well the narrative which guided me focusing on Hebrew letter in a wider context of typographical culture in general. A close look reveals that quite a number of the types come from foundries which were here in Varsha, and this is a chapter which has not yet been researched. And finally, a, f a few months ago, also Spitzer book, on which I had working parallel to the exhibition, came out. It includes photos of most of Tarshish books, accompanied with essays and articles written by men of letters, writers, and bookmakers who discuss relation between form, material, and content. In the biographic chapter, amongst document and text, this portrait of Moshe Spitzer is included, the one I saw seven years ago in the newspaper and which triggered the whole project. Thank you.